I thought we were pre gaming. <laughs> Yeah, oh, we, sure. we were. <laughs> yeah, we are. We, we were. Sometimes the best jokes are in the pregame show. <laughs> yeah, true. That is definitely true. <laughs> Welcome to My Hill to Die On, episode 34. Everyone has things they're passionate about. Things we want our friends to try and experience. So we've convinced each other to try different things. We talk about these experiences to see if we can just get one more person to join us on our Hill to Die On. We have a special guest today, John Moltz. I know him a lot from the Rebound podcast. I listen to him there, but I hear he's on various other podcasts like Turning This Car Around and other incomparable flashcasts, I believe, which I'd like to get into. I just haven't watched those TV shows yet. And I know him from the Crazy Apple Rumors days way back. Uh, I used to read that website when I was uh, younger. Um, so that was a fun, fun part of my day back in the day. Uh, I enjoyed that a lot. Oh, good. I'm glad. I, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you know, contributing on, contributing you had... to your delinquency, I think. <laughs> yeah, um, pretty yeah. much, yeah, in college. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'll give another shout out to Diff, which is the, the podcast that I'm on with Dan Morin and Guy English, which we talk about superhero shows. And that is an incomparable podcast. It's an almost weekly podcast, except since superhero shows have kind of slowed down in the last six months, we've kind of run out of material. But soon we'll be back to our regular scheduled program. <laughs> yeah, I actually haven't ever watched uh, The Flash or Arrow, and I've wanted to get into it. I just haven't had the time. And, At this and point, just... I'm not even sure if it's worth it. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> we talked about it for years, but it's like there are so many of these things that are, I mean, you know, COVID slowed down a lot of it, but mm -hmm. there's so many that are upcoming, and I think they're going to start getting back to a, like a regular schedule of this, and many of them are filming again now. So, oh. and, you know, and I've enjoyed those shows, but I think given the fact that all these Marvel Disney ones are coming out, uh, I'd probably, unless you have a lot of watching time that you're not using, I would probably focus more on those because I bet they're going to be higher, higher quality. Yeah. Jump in on a new show with you guys. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, we're going to, I think we'll, we'll start with uh, WandaVision oh, okay. soon. So probably, by, I mean, certainly by the time this airs. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. I used to keep up on a lot of those shows, but I realized that I was falling off on a lot of the later seasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that was probably, you know. Right. I, I'm pretty standard <laughs> for that. And, and I don't think you were wrong. <laughs> we stuck with Arrow. We stuck with Arrow through the end just because, you know, we were we were covering the show and that was that was what we needed to do. But um it it was it it was kind of hit and miss. I mean, there was some really good stuff uh, here and there, but um it was a it was a sort of hit and miss show. The the inconsistency gets you. Yeah. Well, that's I think it's the problem of the 20, you know, plus season 20 plus episode season because what we would find that would happen is like it would start out great and we'd be super excited about it and then they would get to uh, around this part of the year you know around the january february part of the year and then they would realize you know oh we're we're 12 or whatever episodes in and we need we need 10 more in order to get us to the end and we don't we've run out of ideas like we don't we have a, they, they would have a story arc for the whole season but they wouldn't have enough to fill the entire run of the show so they would have to start scrambling to figure out how like, they would do sort of a random walk around this time of year and that was always annoying so filler episodes yeah exactly people would get taken hostage a lot <laughs> <laughs> and then rescued and then that would be that and then somebody else would get kidnapped and then yes yeah you know, and around and around they go <laughs> how many times can you save this planet yeah. <laughs> turns out a lot actually <laughs> A surprising number of times. I noticed you guys talked about Farscape too, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I did watch some of that. That was fun. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, we were talking, we were, and I think we were talking about this on the, uh, the Biff podcast a few weeks ago about like puppets and just, yeah. mm -hmm. I really liked the fact that they went all in with the puppets on that show because it was such a great and different, a unique aesthetic to the show mm -hmm. that it mm -hmm. made it special. And the puppets that they made were just, so well done yeah i mean it's one thing if you get puppets that are very obviously puppets but in many cases they were just so well done that with the normal suspending of belief you could just get transported into the world of oh yeah these are aliens yeah yeah the pilot was particularly navigator pilot whatever he was but yeah and actually yeah. I was just realizing that three-headed bird thingy on the planet was a puppet too yeah yeah so mm -hmm. yeah, that, yeah interesting the hansons do good work Mm -hmm. They do. I think the biggest thing for me, well, within the last like 15 years since having a kid was Nintendo stuff because 
I missed the whole console generation, basically. I didn't have any kind of a Nintendo device until we got a Wii in, like, 2007. And then all of a sudden, it was, like, all this Mario stuff and everything else. And so my son is a huge fan of all that stuff. And, you know, and now I play it. And, I mean, I've played so much Breath of the Wild, it's ridiculous. Um, but which I absolutely love. And we've gone back, and the funny, the funny thing was going back and playing. Like you know, we we started playing Mario Kart on the Wii, and just played the heck out of that. And still, still, we'll go back and play the original Wii version. I think we were like a few nights ago we were playing it, and we got a retro pie, and we're able to play some of the the older versions of Mario Kart on the retro pie. And we also played it on the DS. And the funny thing, though, is playing the older ones and looking at it, and it's almost as if it was somebody's, like, a joke. Like, someone had put this on the internet. This is what Mario Kart would have looked like 25 years ago. And it's like, (laughs) except this actually is Mario Kart 25 years ago. (laughs) But it's it's just like you'd expect. I mean, everything, all the graphics are just scaled down, and the most of the gameplay is roughly the same. Things are much simpler, and basically the big difference is the graphics are really bad. <laughs> mm-hmm. I will say that when you get on the switch and they have the ability to play some of the older games that were released on Nintendo or super Nintendo, and you go back and play those and remember, Oh yeah, I played this a number of years ago. Mm-hmm. And just realizing that that was actually cutting edge technology back then. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my first console was the 64, and we played Mario Kart 64, and I didn't realize at the time that all previous incarnations of Mario Kart were flat. Like, I was like, oh, Mario, it's yeah. fun. You go up hills, down hills, blah, blah, blah. I was like, oh, that's because 64 could handle the 3D parts of it. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the first console we had, I, we did have a console when I was growing up, but it was, uh, what was it? God, I can't remember the name of it, but it was absolutely terrible. <laughs> and it was not a name brand one. My parents did not get the name brand. They did not get an Atari or whatever. I mean, they got, <laughs> I think they went into a Sears and bought what was on the shelf. And, and then, you know, we had fun with it. But, it, you know, looking back, it was absolutely awful. I'd rather not admit how many consoles I've had. <laughs> <laughs> the number is a little ridiculous at this point. Yeah. I assume you don't keep them. Not in Japan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, not in Japan. Right. I would think not enough storage space. Getting them here would be uh, tough. Yeah. Right now, I only have f- four systems here. <laughs> <laughs> that does seem low. You need a basement. <laughs> well, fortunately, I have my apartment that I have all to myself. So pretty much the living room is the TV with all of the DVDs and things like that. And my NAS set up there so I can stream my movies from there. Mm-hmm. And then all of the systems just hooked up there. So it's basically a really nerdy room Yeah, that people come in, visit, and go, oh, yeah, <laughs> this is right. They, they instantly get the right impression. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. There's <laughs> no hiding. These are modern consoles? These ones are mostly modern consoles. Yeah. yeah. I had to get rid of a lot of my older ones when I moved simply because of money during certain parts of my life Mm -hmm. i still grieve over a couple of games that i sold because i wanted the money at that time and i had a lot of debt yeah yeah you know what can i know yeah i sold a whole comic book collection for like 100 bucks years ago and i'm Mm -hmm. still (laughs) still kicking myself over that decision the one that i grieve the most is i had my super nintendo which had a lot of old rpgs on it And one of them was so rare that at that time, you could sell the cartridge for $50. Wow. And right now, you could potentially double, triple, or quadruple that easily. (laughs) I don't think I've ever had a cartridge like that, that's for sure. I had a cartridge of a game called Chrono Trigger, which, long story short, it's a really great game that everybody loved. (laughs) (laughs) And now can't get. And now you can't get. Well, you can get... Modern consoles had a re-release of it, but it's got some loading problems and things like that. Yeah. 
it's amazing. I mean, I was going to say everything gets ruined, but that's not really true, actually. I mean, you know, just thinking about the Mario stuff that we were talking about. I mean, all this, stu- all that stuff is really improved with age and, and mm-hmm. it's really a testament to what Nintendo has been able to do. Mm-hmm. My neighbors, their kids have been playing Mario Party for the past couple of weeks during Christmas break. And just thinking about even that game and how far it's come in the period of time that that one's been going on since I think the first one came out on a 64. Yeah, my son loves that game. <laughs> and it drives me crazy sometimes. But... <laughs> <laughs> it's like sometimes the games can take a long time depending on how many rounds you, you, he mm-hmm. picks. And mm-hmm. it's just, it's kind yeah. of aggravating. His tolerance for playing stuff like that is way higher than mine. He, and he will happily sit. There's the Tetris 99 on the oh, switch yes. and he will play that like all afternoon if we let him and i really like it and it's not a matter of not liking it but it's so tense for me when it gets up towards the end that you know my heart rate increases and uh, i'm sweating and i just like i can't do that for that long no. And he's much cooler no. about it, I think. Like he doesn't get I don't think he gets that worked up about it. Maybe because he plays it so much. I don't know, but <laughs> he's much calmer about it than I am, and I'm just like trying to win <laughs> desperately. Well, I think it's the fact that it's a head to head Tetris game. Yeah. That is anxiety inducing. I'm sorry. It really is. Yeah, because I don't think I get like that with the regular Tetris. Mm-mm. Yeah, I get that with overcooked with my daughters. We play overcooked. Oh, okay. Especially because my daughters run with their heads cut off and they don't know what they're doing. So it's quite <laughs> stressful, but quite fun too at the same time. Yes, because you're sitting there going, just get me the thing. Yeah, get me the cucumber. Come on. How are you chopping that cucumber? Go pick up that rice. It's burning. <laughs> <laughs> we have not played that one, but my wife and my son both like Cooking Mama, which kind of drives me crazy. But um... <laughs> <laughs> stress inducing games. Yep. <laughs> that one's not stress inducing. I just I don't really enjoy the gameplay that much. <laughs> if I remember right, Cooking Mama is a lot of like little mini games combined together in the guise of cooking food. It's sort of something like that. Well, you're just chopping food or you're folding burritos or you're pouring things into pans or stirring. And oh, is it Switch? Yeah, there is one version of it for the Switch, which he just got. So now it's a thing again. <laughs> <laughs> they both like to, you know, tease me about it and like try and get me to play it all the time, even though I can't stand it. <laughs> and that's when you say, uh, I'll play Breath of the Wild again. Yeah, which I will. <laughs> <laughs> that is the game that I will play for six hours straight. That is my type of game as well. I said I had never played a Zelda game before, mm. uh, and that was my introduction to it and was pretty blown away. Yeah, that is a very interesting introduction to Zelda in my mind. Yeah. Because that was a complete reimagining from the normal formula. Yeah. He had the one previous to that, the one for the Wii. I can't remember the name of it. That was much more one track, right? I mean, you think you couldn't roam around and do whatever you wanted to do. The one on the Wii, the problem was there were two on the Wii, if I remember right. One was Twilight Princess and one was Skyward Sword. Must be Twilight Princess, I think. Can't remember. I don't think he played that that much. I think it wasn't as compelling for him. And he's played a lot of them. But the two of us have played Breath of the Wild. I mean, my God. <laughs> you know, it's not a, not a cheap game as far as games go now, but we've definitely gotten our money's worth like about 10 times over. Yeah, that's the thing is games like that, you can just keep investing more and more hours into. I think the one that I'm guilty of the most with that is how many times I have played through and beaten Skyrim. <laughs> which is your quintessential fantasy world RPG. Mm -hmm. And you just, here's the world, go explore. Yeah. Well, that's the dangerous part. Just being able to do anything you want to. True story. It's like having a basement. (laughs) (laughs) Because you can fill it with whatever you want to. Which is why I don't have a basement. And that's what happened. When we came to look at this house, the real estate agent was like, oh, it's got a large basement. And my wife and I were like, oh, God. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that just means we're gonna fill it with <laughs> and sure enough that is exactly what we've done <laughs> i will say that it has been nice being in japan i at one point had moved into a house because it was super cheap and ended up filling up many rooms of that house and then i chose to move into a smaller apartment <laughs> which forced me to get rid yeah. of a whole bunch of chunk that's a wise decision yeah this room that I podcast in is in the basement and things at my knees and feet here are just absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> There's a performa. 
Oh, which number? Uh, 6,400. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, actually, it was a good machine. I mean, it's got a subwoofer in the, mm-hmm. in in the, the tower. It's got the sounds really good, yeah. Um, do you have the zip drive in the top compartment? No, I do have a zip drive here, too. <laughs> 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 I, have extru- I have a SCSI zip drive, <laughs> which is actually the second one that I got because this was like two, three, I don't know. Actually, it was probably more like five now, um, years ago. I, Hank wanted to get it out to just, he likes to get them out every now and again fire them up and just see what <laughs> oh, yeah. experience what things were like and uh, we were getting the zip drive out and i was giving him a hard time saying like be careful with this thing be careful and i put it i sat it on top of the 6400 in the basement on the cement floor and then went to plug something in the back of the tower and it slid off and smashed on the <gasps> the cement floor so i <laughs> I contacted Grant Hutchinson, who's a Canadian guy who has a whole collection of old, mostly Mac stuff, but like a lot of different. One of you is a Newton fan. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's the guy who runs the Newton web server. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I had known him online for years and met him a few years ago. And I sent him an old power book at one point that I wasn't using. And I had a feeling that he might have an extra zip drive lying around. And sure enough, he did. So he sent it to me. So (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> now I have my zip drive back for all the good it'll do me. <laughs> my family had a 6400 for a little while. It was a nice one. Yeah, that lasted me quite a while. So mm-hmm. I used to play Glider all the time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I played that, too. <laughs> that, that was a game I wasted many hours in. Yeah. yeah sorry. Well, I think the two things I played on that one, this machine, the most were Marathon mm-hmm. and probably Myth, which Myth is one of my favorite games of all time if we're talking about favorite games of all time. Uh, (laughs) It's definitely up there with Breath of the Wild. It's a fantastic game. Well, we thought we would talk about some interesting things we've had in Japan. Usually we pick up a funny soda, because there's always funny sodas in Japan. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) I miss funny sodas. I have three different ones in my refrigerator right now just waiting for (laughs) our next episodes. Yeah. <laughs> At the beginning, I thought, oh, we'll have a hard time coming up with a drink for every episode. <laughs> and surprisingly not. No, no. <laughs> we can come up with a drink for every episode. Yeah, I'm not that surprised. I mean, you could always just go to coffee. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, the cans of coffee. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I, the people in America miss the Tommy Lee Jones coffee commercials here in Japan. They're quite fun. <laughs> he is the boss, <laughs> is the slogan or something like that. Yeah, something like that. It's it's for boss coffee. <laughs> what did Schwarzenegger do? Like cup of noodles ad? Is that? Oh, did he really? I haven't seen. That. I think he did something, and I can't remember now. I can't remember what it was, but I think it was cup of noodles. But I can't now. I can't remember. <laughs> that would be hilarious. I would like to see that. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. There's yeah. I I remember being kind of weirded out by the idea originally, by just by the idea of hot vending machines, mm-hmm. because here everything is you know they're all cold. I don't think I've ever seen a hot vending machine in the United States. And then, you know, once you try it, you're like, this is really good. (laughs) The coffee is usually extremely sweet, but still, like when you want a coffee and you're like right there on the side of the road and there's a vending machine, you can get a hot coffee. (laughs) You can get a hot coffee in a cup out of a vending machine here, Mm -hmm. but you can't get one in a can. Mm -hmm. I remember when I first came to Japan for studying abroad when I was getting my undergrad. By the time I left that college dorm room i had created a pyramid of empty cans of coffee (laughs) wait but you're supposed to drink it right in front of the machine and put the can in the little thingy ryan yeah right you're not supposed to certainly not supposed to walk around drinking it (laughs) i broke all the rules what can i say (laughs) (laughs) i'm sure you've probably done the ones that i know which i are the ones that i can remember kalpas Mm. oh kalpas good stuff isn't it and pokari sweat Mm -hmm. did you have Uh, cc lemon john Oh, yeah, CC Lemon. Yep, yep. Oh, yep. I noticed that you had done that one. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just laughing because I'm now imagining all of our listeners going, oh, here they go about CC Lemon again. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. I don't remember. I don't. I never really liked Bukhari Sweat very much. No. No, no, me neither. And I don't remember the taste of Kalpas. I certainly remember the name, but I don't remember the taste. And CC Lemon is just like a lemon. For yeah. Again, like... mm-hmm. Lemon soda, basically. Yeah, right. That's good. Yeah, and if you're going to go for a sports drink, I definitely would always say Aquarius over Pokari Sweat. Oh, yeah, Aquarius. Yeah, 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 I would agree with that. Because we gave Dan Moore a little bit lead time when we when we had him on. Sorry, John. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we sent him huge bottles of Kelpis because that's all they had on Amazon. 
Um, yeah, I don't think he finished them. <laughs> yeah, probably not. You'll have to ask him because he didn't tell us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If he didn't tell you, I bet he didn't. <laughs> Kelpis has an interesting flavor. It, I think you get over it and then you enjoy it. Yeah. Agree to disagree on that. I never got over it. <laughs> oh, yeah? No, well, I enjoy it. You are a person who enjoys it. That is a statement. <laughs> That's true. You have to get over the name and get over the color. And yeah, and then... yeah. I don't remember having like a go-to though, particularly. Mm. I would drink a CC lemon, but well, there's an orange one too, right? Is there's like an orange version of CC lemon or something? Well, it's orange Fanta. That's or Nachan. Is it Nachan? Uh, no, I can't remember. Maybe I'm conflating things, but I would usually go for like an orange drink over a lemon drink. Mm-hmm. It might have been Nachan or something like that. Okay. Yeah. The thing that I normally would drink and still drink and sometimes make it home because you can't just go into a grocery store actually now i think you can like our local metropolitan market has this but uh iced oolong oh yeah Mm -hmm. which i absolutely love and you know got into the first time i was in japan and have been drinking it ever since Mm -hmm. yeah i like oolong tea yeah they they do have it frequently i'm not as big of a fan of it as my wife my wife likes it a lot yeah for a long time and i was making big pictures of ice too long in the refrigerator and Mm -hmm. i haven't done that recently um, because i can't get through an entire pitcher without it going bad (laughs) without developing some sludge in the bottom so i generally don't do it but and also like with three people in the house it's like we don't have a huge refrigerator and that takes up a lot of space refrigerator real estate is important (laughs) yep (laughs) what's the other drink the tea drink my wife makes big jugs of the uh the barley tea mugicha Mugicha, that's it. Yeah, Mugicha, right. Yep, mm-hmm. yep. Yeah, yeah. I like that too. But I don't think I can get that here, at least not. I mean, I can go to an Asian market and get it, but I can't yeah. get it. Um, not in the grocery store. Way. Yeah. And I would just, I mean, I've been getting, for years, been getting like a huge box of oolong off of Amazon and <laughs> <laughs> going through it slowly. If I'm getting a tea, I tend to like, I like the lemon teas. Yeah, especially from the hot vending machines. Oh, yeah. Or even hot royal milk tea from the hot vending machines. They're good stuff too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, an iced coffee in general was a thing that I got into in Japan, mm-hmm. which wasn't, I don't think, a thing here. It is now. And you can, obviously, you can get an iced coffee in Starbucks now or any coffee place. But at the time, it was, you know, something you had to make at home if you were going to make it at all. Yeah. But I will say, having the hot coffee in the vending machines is fantastic because if nothing else, especially on winter days, you get mm-hmm. one of those cans and you use the can as a hand warmer. Mm-hmm. As you're walking to work. Yep, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, so the only time that I worked in Japan was that summer that I was there. So I was there from like the worst part of the year. Oh, like yeah. April through. You're right. April to August. <laughs> that would have been nice and hot. Yeah. It was awful. And it, at the time, 2000, the Japan office still had a dress code. So we were wearing suits. And I only had wool blend suits. <laughs> oh. <laughs> So I would walk like 20 minutes to the office and I would be drenched by the time I got there. And, oh. and, you know, and at one point, like we were having a meeting and I was picking up a guy's coat. So you could, we were switching chairs or something like that. And I was helping him move the chairs and I picked up this guy's blazer to move it. And I was like, oh, my God, this is so light. This is <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> Fortunately, like I think it was for the last month, they finally switched dress code. So it was business casual after that. So I could just wear like something that was... <laughs> not gonna make me die on the way to work i will say yeah that is the worst time to come to japan is during those months the only time that my folks have ever been able to actually make it to japan is during the peak summer months Mm -hmm. so we're from chicago so they just show up and melt oh yeah that's probably worse yeah it's nice having being in an area that has a reasonable number of asian markets unfortunately with covid i don't get to them as much as i would like to Mm. and there isn't one that's like super close to us it takes at least like 20 minutes to get to the nearest one Mm -hmm. but it's fun to go and my son likes to do it too is like just go and walk up and down the aisles and find like weird things to eat and 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 for me just find the stuff that i used to eat in japan Uh, lovely lovely carl haichu yeah (laughs) haichu But like, and just shrimp, like shrimp chips. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Ebi san, ah, yep. good stuff. Yeah, yeah. Some, my my kids took out some yesterday. They're good. Yeah, I mean, pretty salty, but uh, delicious. Oh, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, I'm sure they're horrible. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, no, they're not. Yeah, I mean, like potato chips aren't good for you either, really. But... 
It's not. It's not a contest. <laughs> <laughs> they can all be horrible. <laughs> the thing I miss the most, though, is just being able to walk out. You know, like having lived in Tokyo in particular, being able to walk out your door and just going down the block and finding some place to get like great ramen or sushi. Yes. Um, within, yeah, you... within a like you know like a two minute walk. Yeah, I will say that because I am trying to be extra cautious about COVID, I don't get to do that as much as I'd like. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Right. Because I'm basically doing a lot of walk in, see if they will allow me to take it home, and that's about it. Just because yeah. I don't want to risk it. I don't want to be the one yeah. to bring COVID into the school. Right. <laughs> Japan is really nice that everything is super close, just in general. I mean, even, even where mm -hmm. we live in the suburbs things are really close together i mean we only bought yeah. a car in the last year and a half i mean we've been without a car for the for the first 15 years i was here um yeah. even when we had kids and pushing kids through strollers and train stations um wow. in the occasional taxi because doing the trains and the occasional taxi even though taxis are relatively expensive compared to american taxis is still cheaper than owning a car Mm -hmm. There's no relatively expensive. It's more expensive. <laughs> it's more expensive than American taxis. And, and getting a driver's license is hard. Yes. I mean, really, it's hard, harder than here. Harder than there. Although you don't have to parallel park. But <laughs> oh. it's just a lot of paperwork, <laughs> right? I mean... Um. Yeah. There was one night where I missed the last train because I got stranded in the middle of nowhere and had to take a taxi back. And because I was absolutely in the middle of nowhere and I had work in the morning. And I ended up probably racking up a, and this is back when I first came to Japan. I think I ended up racking about a mon and a half to two mon bill. Jeez. That's like, yeah, 150 to 200 dollars, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it's almost cheaper to get a hotel, <laughs> but then again, if you were in the middle of nowhere. Oh yeah, it could have been. Yeah. yeah. It, mm -hmm. it would have definitely been cheaper. Also, I was in the middle of nowhere, so there were no hotels. Yeah. There. No. Yeah. It was one of those spots where uh, the front half of the train goes off and the back half stops. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I was in the back half. That's always fun. Well, I remember, always remember the time that we pulled into a train station and we pulled back out again. And I was like, are we going out the same way we came in? <laughs> <laughs> like, oops, I guess we were supposed to get off here. <laughs> Well, although there are some train stations that do that, there's a train uh, a train stop just up our line that will that pulls in and you come out the same way you went in. <laughs> but it goes to a different location. But it goes to a different place. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. you're going. No, this down this the was line. not this, this 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 was like the you know it was a it was a local or, or like it was stopping at that station and then oh, and turning, then turning around, around back the other direction. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The train. So I traveled with a couple of friends the first time I was in Japan and and uh, we decided to go to from Tokyo to Kyushu. And we didn't have enough money to go by bullet trains, so we were mostly doing like local trains, and so that was always a challenge. Yeah, that's a fun adventure. <laughs> yeah, it was a good time. Right before COVID hit, I was actually planning on you can get these tickets that make all local trains super cheap for a couple of days, and I was going to take a bunch of local trains and go down to Kyushu, whole trip, mm -hmm. and then COVID hit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. So, yeah, you should try that though when it you know opens up again yeah i was i would love to but yeah i remember like the speaking of hotels i when i went to japan the second time i think i was slightly overconfident i did not make a reservation <laughs> <laughs> when i got in so i get into tokyo and get into nani to go take to train to ueno and i get out and i'm like it's like nine o'clock at night <laughs> i was like oh I probably wasn't thinking this through. Was <laughs> now what? So I wandered around. And I ended up at a capsule hotel, which was a completely miserable, completely miserable experience. But I only stayed there one night, and then I switched to a business hotel the next night, which was, you know, mm -hmm. very small but perfectly fine. And now I can say that I've done the capsule hotel. <laughs> yeah, I actually it, haven't experienced it. I've only seen them. <laughs> really? You you it's have no it. good. <laughs> I don't know what the capsules are like now because this was, you know, 30 years ago, basically, or 35 years ago. Um, and I, I'm hoping that they're better than they were. But the whole thing was just like a preformed piece of plastic. And so, you know, you crawl into this tube and some dude rolls over like four tubes over and everybody feels it. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah, it's not you, I did not sleep. I will say that 
at least the one that I was in, because I have done Capsule Hotel once, the one that I was in did not feel that way. It was it felt pretty well built. Okay, good. Well, I'm glad that the, <laughs> glad the experience is, you know, it should improve over 35 years, you think. But you are clearly just climbing straight into a tube. Yeah. I don't remember where I was going, but I it was one of my trips and I ended up just shoving my backpack into the corner because I was going to leave right away in the morning. So I had the tube that had my giant backpack that had everything in it by my feet and then me. And that was <laughs> it. <laughs> well, yeah, and I I'm five nine and it was too short for me. You know, like I, I had to sleep slightly with my knees slightly bent. Well, and I, like I said, I didn't really sleep. Well, well again, <laughs> uh, to give you hope for the updates to that, I am a little over 5'10", and I felt fine. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. With a backpack. Well, I'm, I'm probably never going to have the opportunity to try it again. <laughs> oh, come I mean, on. I hope to get I hope to get back to Japan sometime, but with my family and I'm we're not all staying in a capsule hotel. <laughs> yeah. L- let's be fair. It, it's one of those experiences that it's a you do it once and you're good. Yeah, right. Speaking of uh, games earlier, I did have the experience of driving through Tokyo on the highways again. And every time I drive through Tokyo's on the highway, I really feel like that Mario Kart game. Well, <laughs> on the N64 where the trucks, I think they have it in the in the new Oh, yeah, Switch yeah, Moon, v- Moon View Highway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it yeah. feels just like that. Like, oh, right. my goodness, there's cars coming everywhere. There's exits everywhere. Are you supposed to get off here or there? Or there's a highway on top of you and a highway below you? Which one yeah. are you supposed to be on? But now I, I'm definitely feeling more confident now, especially this last trip to Disney Sea that we took this last month. But yeah. Yeah, now I re- at least recognize more of the highway names as they're flying by. Like, okay, yep, yeah. this isn't the exit I'm taking. Or, oh, yes, now and I need in, to in get Tokyo, over. I mean, I would imagine most of the signs in Tokyo have English versions. Most too, of them have which, English. But yeah. the, the biggest problem is Google is not telling you the things that are on the signs, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like C t- the C1 and the 6 are splitting. So which side of the road do I need to be on? doesn't always tell you that because... Yeah, it yeah. just assumes you're staying on C1. So yeah. I now I understand it better, but it, it was definitely very nerve-wracking early on, especially because the, cur- the curves, there's like almost no shoulder almost the whole time. <laughs> it's super scary. Oh, yeah. And you're flying yeah. around at 60, bumper to bumper. <laughs> um, yeah. So, woo-hoo. Which, and that's like a metaphor for the whole country for me to a certain degree. Well, particularly like the first year that, that I lived in Tokyo was, I was ready to leave <laughs> and i think it you know like i think it's a better experience if you're like outside of tokyo i mean part of it is just being in a big city and i wasn't quite used to that mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. at the time because i grew up in a relatively small town and i went to college you know in like the cornfields of ohio so and then and then spent a year in tokyo i was like whoa that, that's a bit of a difference <laughs> yeah I, I felt pretty claustrophobic by the end and i remember getting to seattle i, I stayed uh, for the summer in Seattle and a friend picked me up at the airport and driving just up north to Seattle from the airport. I was just like, Oh my God, <laughs> there's so much space here. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's unbelievable. <laughs> what a bunch of wasted space. <laughs> <laughs> I, do, I do feel that going to America. The car's humongous. Look how big the planes are. Why is there so much space between these buildings? That is space that you can utilize. Exactly. You can put an entire row of vending machines there. <laughs> Yeah. Japan does vending machines correctly. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, I yeah, I, I do. I did definitely enjoyed that. I mean, particularly like too much. The the second time I enjoyed the beer vending <laughs> machines probably a little bit too much. But that was the only because we were like we were out in the middle of kind of in the middle of nowhere. We were right on the side of Mount Fuji, and like we wanted to walk into a store, it would take at least a half an hour it'd probably take like 40 minutes round trip and so anytime we wanted to have a beer we had to use the vending machine that was the only way to get a beer did you it ever works. climb to the top of fuji i did not a team a group of uh students did at the time and there was like a big kerfuffle because one of the kids couldn't make it back down and they had to get a helicopter to get him because <laughs> he didn't have like the he didn't like he was wearing sneakers i mean he wasn't even like and it was it was ridiculous um i think they they didn't take it seriously enough so i did i did not i didn't feel like something that i felt like i needed to do um but my room i mean my room faced fuji it was like it was right i mean there was not much of the tree line and there was nothing else between in between the campus and 
you know, there's the tree line in between the campus and the rest of Fuji, but nothing mm-hmm. else. And so the view was spectacular. Mm-hmm. Nate, have you ever done it? Yeah, I've done it twice, actually. And yeah, it, it's surprising how much down is a hike too, right? You would think oh, sure. oh, up is, yeah. you know, up is hard, up is hard. And then down, right. it's got to be easy. No, no, down is a hike. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. I did the night climb where you mm-hmm. reach the top right as the sun is rising. <laughs> oh, nice. Which is beautiful. But yeah, coming down is the worst thing because it feels like loose gravel. And mm-hmm. so it's just impact on your knees oh, because yeah. you're you're trying to keep your grip with your feet the entire time. And it's just rough going down the entire time. I think that's why it is loose gravel, but still, it's not easy. <laughs> yeah. For my experience, I mean, I'd done a little bit of hiking most of it years ago, though. But I mean, I, that always seems to be the case, right? <laughs> like. <laughs> you're working to go up but you're stable and then mm-hmm. coming back down you're already tired and your legs are a little wobbly and you've got much bigger chance of falling on the way down ah uh, yep yeah that's why if i go hiking i usually like to take hiking poles yeah because that's a good idea right because that way i can also um yell at the yell at the youngins and go i can do this <laughs> you can shake yeah you can shake a pole at them yep if I can do this, you guys can too. <laughs> In my day, we didn't have mountains. Everything was flat, <laughs> and it was all one <laughs> continent. And yet somehow it was still uphill both ways. <laughs> it was all one continent. <laughs> Pangea, we called it. <laughs> all my friends were dinosaurs. <laughs> That's about right. Dad, there's a crazy person on the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> well, the second time I went up was actually July 4th, and there was actually some uh, servicemen from the local base that had climbed up that day too. So it was kind of interesting, speaking of America. Um, <laughs> so they were celebrating 4th of July on the top of the mountain. It was kind of That's fun. That's interesting. Yeah. Yes, because nothing says 4th of July like... <laughs> the, the top of Mount Fuji. The top of Mount Fuji. <laughs> <laughs> This is how we celebrate our country in another country. <laughs> do, do, do they drive a truck up? <laughs> no, they won't. They, it seems yeah. like they were actually polite servicemen, which was that nice. It seems to like see. the real way to celebrate it. No, you need more explosions. <laughs> right, right. Drive a truck full of fireworks up. <laughs> but they were but you say they were polite servicemen. They were po- they were polite servicemen. <laughs> it's good to see in Japan. <laughs> yeah, there are a number of very polite servicemen that we've interacted with. Yeah. Uh, the problem is there are others who have given servicemen a bad name. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, right. I never got to Hokkaido. I wish that I had, but still on my list. Yeah, I was in Sapporo for a summer. It was, it was a nice place, but I didn't get to go skiing. I, I wish I would have done that. Yeah. I'm hoping to make it to uh, one of the snow festivals. Yes. Right. Right. That seems like that would be great. But the problem is those are in February. Yeah, they're in February. Mm-hmm. And yeah. February tends to be, yeah. so there's this thing. Yeah. Um, and school. <laughs> that, I don't know what you're talking about. The, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there's a two day break, but probably this year's not the year to go. You know, I ask my boss every year, hey, can you just let me go and play in the snow for a couple of days? <sighs> He's just so mean. I would say, what's different than that? You being here, <laughs> would we miss you if you left? Oh, wait a oh, oh! <laughs> now I know how you really feel about me. <laughs> we'd have to get a substitute for you, so yes, we'd miss you. <laughs> Sorry. How is the? How far do you have to go to go skiing? Is it? I don't I don't remember. Like, I mean, I'm also I'm partly wondering how mm. much global warming has affected <laughs> the distance that you have to go from Tokyo. Uh, it's not. It's not too bad. Two two hours away. Uh, I okay. drove this this winter break. We went to a ski resort, mostly to do sledding with our kids. We didn't actually do skiing because mm-hmm. our kids are still kind of young. But it was a two and a half hour car trip, and I took it nice and slow because it was uh, with our new car. I didn't want to go too fast on the snow, so up the mountain we went. It took us like an hour. We're yeah. supposed to take us half an hour, but yeah, it, it it's not too bad. We also have a coworker who likes to go skiing many weekends out of the year, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd say probably an hour and a half to two hours. Yeah, I think I think that's the minimum to get, probably go up to Guma area. Yeah, 
I never, yeah, I never went skiing. I mean, I, yeah, I don't know. Skiing, I guess the, like the, the place that's close here is usually really crowded too. It's probably not much different than what the experience would be like there, mm -hmm. but I don't, you know, that's obviously not my favorite experience. <laughs> going, you know, when you go skiing, obviously you don't want lines at all. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, you know, and if every once in a while that happens, it's a good time, but it's not, not what you can get easily. And it's not the usual. The, the last time I went to a mountain, I attempted to go snowboarding. Which was a choice and a poor one. <laughs> it ended with me breaking my tailbone, actually. Oh, oh no, really? really? Oh, wow. Yeah. wow. Okay. Yeah, I'm not going snowboarding again. Yeah. <laughs> I would imagine not. Did you ever go, Ryan, to the indoor Cebu uh, snow thing? There, there, there's actually an indoor ski r resort next to the Cebu Dome. Nope. I went two times, like 10, 15 years ago now, I guess. Wow, it's been a long time. It was quite interesting, indoor skiing area. A lot of fake snow, but yeah, mm. but it was fun. It was expensive, but it was very close. So yeah, how big is it? I think it was only like two hundred meters down. Okay, uh, something like that's that. Maybe still kind of a lot, though. That's still. I mean, you know, I mean, I don't. I guess I can't really picture. I'd have to look up. Look it up. Maybe I'm. Maybe I'm completely but... wrong, though. I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe you are misremembering it. Yeah, that could very well be. It felt long to me, but I was very new at skiing, so yeah. Sayama Ski is what it's called. Do they still have a website? A lot of say, a lot of that stuff is dying, so I don't know. Oh, really? Yeah. Just because of COVID stuff, or? I uh, no, it was some of the. Like, um, it's too expensive to maintain. <laughs> yeah, I think so. The longest run is three hundred meters. It says uh, the slope gradient is fifteen oh, really? degrees. Sayama Ski. Hmm. Yep. Three hundred. That's what it says. Wow. Cool. Yeah. Sayama Ski Resort in Saitama. I mean, that's you know, that's nice. It's. Full ski experience is like getting, I mean, getting out someplace where there's not a lot of people and being, like, you know, that's my favorite ski experience, of course, but you can't, you can't get that most of the time anyway. <laughs> yeah. Every once in a while, though, I mean, like we went to, so my wife was vehemently against downhill skiing for years because she, because Sonny Bono died that way. <laughs> oh, yeah. So we went cross country skiing for years mm. and the boots just constantly hurt her feet. She tried so hard, but the boots would never fit her right for whatever reason. And so we had a friend who worked for REI at the time, and she got free tickets to see this uh, Warren Miller movie, who's the big, you know, ski guy. I mean, he makes these incredible ski movies with people doing incredible stunts and stuff like that. And so she's like, you want to go to this? You guys want to go to this ski movie? And so we're like, yeah, sure. And coming out of that, she was just like, oh, my God, I want to go downhill skiing. <laughs> <laughs> so that was 2004. For, and so she said, let's get ski lessons. And I hadn't skied in like 15 years. And I was like, yeah, okay. And so we got ski lessons and she loved it and had a good time. And we went to Snoqualmie, which is like the close place here, um, which is, you know, like right close to the freeway. It's about an hour and 15, 20 minutes from us. And, you know, so it tends to be more crowded, um, but it's a decent enough um, ski, ski area. And then towards the end of the year, we were having such a good time, we decided to go to Whistler, <laughs> which completely ruined us. But it was great. And we had like a wonderful time and, you know, ran into some friends there and like managed to go to some places on the mountain that not many people were. And of course, it's, you know, it's like one of the best ski areas in the world. And then we tried to go back to Snoqualmie like the last weekend of the season. We're like, this sucks. <laughs> <laughs> we have destroyed this place for ourselves. <laughs> we can never go back here, which is not true. But we do go back there every once in a while. Mm. Um, and now, and now our son skis, and actually, yeah, he'll be they're going tomorrow. And I'm gonna stay here with the dogs. <laughs> yeah, once you go to a place like that, it must be hard to go back. Yeah, you get ruined. Certainly, I mean, like you can wait until next season, and then it's you know, then it's a little different. You know, you're you're re you get a bit of a reset in the off season. Today, because we watched a show about sport in general, because it's not a show about sport, but anyway, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> a show that relates to sport. <laughs> We're gonna pick two sport related things in our life that have happened, which hopefully will be fun. These are kind of experiences or stories, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, of something related as a sport in our life. So I'm going to pick on Ryan to go first. <laughs> Great. Okay, good. Because <laughs> he's the most sporty of all of us. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I know I know sport. I know it exists. <laughs> hey, I played sport in middle school. Yeah, middle. Uh, no, I was also in high school. Uh, I, was, I also had a sport that I played in high school for a year. 
and then realized that that was not for me and i joined <laughs> the drama department <laughs> nice good decision yeah yeah i did wrestling for a year and then went no wrestling really isn't for me but musical theater now that's my jam <laughs> <laughs> So I thought I'd pick the most random, ridiculous question or uh, story first, not question. Word. I know how words work. <laughs> Maybe it's all the wrestling that <laughs> has affected your brain. Yes. With my zero win year. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you decide you didn't work good? <laughs> uh, you know, what can I say? It's yeah. I mean, it might just take time, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Anyway. So the most ridiculous story I have is actually when I was younger, my parents worked at a college and all the people who lived on the college and their kids all went to, I believe it was a White Sox game. So we're at the White Sox game and I was a teenager at the time. And so I sat with all the teenagers and we ended up moving up into the bleachers very far from all of the adults who probably would have <laughs> kept us from doing stupid things. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my friends decided that they were going to cheer not for the White Sox, but for the team that was opposing the White Sox. <laughs> and I, in my infinite wisdom, decided that I was not going to cheer for either of the teams playing at the field at that moment. I was going to start cheering for a team that was playing three <laughs> states away. Could they hear you? Uh, no, they could not hear me. Oh, now, okay. the reason why I bring up this story is because about five rows in front of us, there were college-age guys who had clearly a few too many drinks at that moment. And every time we cheered, they would look back at us and stare daggers. And this happened for about half an inning before they decided that they were going to stand up and confront a bunch of teenagers. And we're talking like we were between the ages of like 13 and 16. And these guys were clearly at least college age, if not older. So I believe, I think I was cheering for the Pirates when it was a game against the White Sox <laughs> and somebody else. I don't even know why. <laughs> so all this led to, they basically started confronting the teenagers, which makes sense, clearly. Mm -hmm. And I had one friend in particular who was in this group who was hmm, the type of person who doesn't back down when being confronted. And so basically just kept escalating the situation until it got to the point where it very nearly broke into a fight in the middle of a <laughs> baseball stadium because they were yelling at us and in the words of the college age people they were so angry at us because we were cheering for a team that wasn't there and they were so confused that it didn't make sense that they mm -hmm. they were just so angry at us it did lead to a small uh, altercation that wow. was eventually de-escalated when all of the parents of the teenagers just suddenly swarmed up and surrounded the kids. And the sheer numbers scared the other people into backing down <laughs> with grumbles. And I think the final statement was, just stop cheering for the pirates. They're not here. <laughs> so it was you. So clearly it was all my fault. <laughs> it was all your fault. It was all my fault. That was the last straw. That was the last straw that actually made them come up and have to yeah. argue with us. So I just thought that if I'm going to tell a sports story, me nearly starting a fight in the middle of a baseball <laughs> field was necessary to tell. <laughs> because nothing quite epitomizes my expertise with sports like me knowing so much and caring so much about the sport that I'm willing to start a fight with random people because I'm cheering for a team that isn't there. Yeah, that's always the best. I mean, really <laughs> going to a sporting event and caring a lot about the outcome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is often a recipe for disaster. <laughs> yes. Yeah. As someone who has gone 
to sporting events and cared. I mean, like I the times when I have a really good time are usually the times when I'm just like I'm there to have fun. And exactly. Not worry about it. Yeah. And I think that's the thing is I just cared so little. Right. That I just was saying, I'm going to have a little fun and joke around. Yeah. And apparently some people took offense at that. Right. Because they're the ones who are there. we like super concerned about who wins and who loses. Oh, and by the way, the team was losing. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's also that's also going to put them in a bad mood. <laughs> <laughs> Probably doesn't help. Probably didn't help. Yeah. We have a Mariners, you know, the Mariners um, mm-hmm. minor league team is in, I'm in Tacoma and they're here. And so we, the best times that I've had at baseball games practically have been going to Rainier's games because it just doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't really care if the Rainier's win or lose, but I'm there to spend time with friends and have a good time. Mm-hmm. Well, when I said that I watch baseball, I mean, pretty much the only American team I would watch when I was back in the States was I followed the Cubs occasionally. Yeah. Because that was the team that was closest to where I grew up. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I would ever consider myself a Cubs fan, but I enjoy watching the Cubs. That's about it. Yeah. That's my level of passion. And until recently, we knew what to expect from the Cubs. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, really. I know. Yeah, it's very confusing times. (laughs) (laughs) They might win. Wait a minute. (laughs) This makes no sense. That seems impossible. That's not supposed to happen. So that's my quick little silly story. I have a story from when I was growing up, and I think this stands out to me because it was mildly traumatic. And I was, I don't know, I must have been really young, like five or younger. But my father used to teach at a middle school. He's still a teacher. He just teaches at another school now. But he used to teach at a middle school, and... We went to a basketball game for some reason. I don't even know why we were there because we didn't go to basketball games that often. And I'm pretty sure it was a middle school basketball game. Although part of my memory of the event feels like these kids were really old. But of course, if they were in middle school and I was five, yeah, they probably felt really old. But to me, you know, looking back on it, they felt as tall as high schoolers, right? But I'm sure they were just middle schoolers because I was out of middle school. That tends to be how that works. <laughs> To me, they felt towering. But I saw my dad cross the court to the other side one time when the team was on the other side of the court. And he said, you know, stay here. I'll be right back. And, of course, I thought, I don't want to stay here. I want to cross the court, too, (laughs) to see whatever my dad was doing. (laughs) So I decided that, you know, two minutes later, I, I needed to get off that bench and cross the court, too. But, of course, the basketball team wasn't quite on the other side of the court by the time I decided I wanted to cross the court. So the referees blew the whistle and stopped the whole game and guided me off to the baseline, which is not where I wanted to be. (laughs) And I was super upset at him bringing me to the baseline and super afraid of him holding my arm as he's dragging me off the court. (laughs) That It was fairly traumatic. And then I think my dad came running around to catch me. But I was like... No, I wanted to go over there. And it, it's a funnier memory because it's semi-traumatic to me. And I don't remember who we were playing. And everybody, I'm sure, was really young and it was so not important. But I was a little bit upset that I you know, messed up the game a little bit. But yeah, it's so inconsequential, I'm sure. But, but back then, it was the, it was the world, right? It, this was, oh, yeah. I needed to go see my dad. And I think he was just saying hi to somebody and coming back, really, in all reality, right? right. He was only going to be gone for a second. I... I mean, this isn't a terribly funny story, but when we went to Japan in 2000, I was there because I was sent for business. So I was working in the office, you know, long hours because <laughs> that's, that's what, what you do, do in Japan. Japan. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and my wife was writing for the local newspaper at the time, and they agreed to let her go for three months. And she was going to do some just like piecemeal articles for them from Japan because in 2000, the Mariners got Kazuhiro Sasaki from the Yokohama Bay Stars. So she decided that she was going to like do some baseball stuff. She had never done any sports writing before. And she went and managed to get interviews with some of the players. So she you know, she was interviewing basically just the English speaking players. And one of the guys that she interviewed was, I think, playing third base for them. And, you know, I played a bunch of time with them in the U.S., but was you know, spending some time in 2000. And you know, I guess he had been, you know, not picked up by anybody f- for the 2000 season. And so he was playing in Japan and had actually played with Sasaki for a while. And so she talked to this guy for a while. His name is Lou Merloni. And then we also like we also went to some games and she got me to talk to a couple of the fans 
you know, in my <laughs> my not great <laughs> translations, you know, we, she managed to get at least a few quotes to send back. And I took some pictures and that was so it was all really fun. And we had a really good time doing it. And it was, you know, for me, it was fun seeing my pictures in the paper later. And for her, it was kind of cool to be doing a sports story, interviewing these people and being down on the field and everything. And so we were there from like April through the end of August and came back and we're watching the end of the baseball season in September and I'm sitting there looking at the TV and I was like, what was the name of that guy that you interviewed? And I'm watching that Boston was playing somebody and I was like, you know, when we were in Japan, the baseball player you interviewed and she's like Lou Maloney. And I was like, he's at bat in this game. <laughs> so somehow he had managed like to, to get uh, Boston had picked him up or something <laughs> and he was playing for Boston again and was at bat, you know, towards the end of the season for the Red Sox. <laughs> and I was just like, that was very weird. It was like a month ago or whatever. <laughs> you were talking to this guy in Japan and now he's in Fenway Park. <laughs> this is a very strange world we live in. So that was, it was just kind of fun and, and, um, surprising there at the end <laughs> Neato. that is kind of crazy to see how quickly that turned around though mm -hmm. yeah and i was surprised because they weren't even i mean i would have thought that maybe he get could have gotten picked up for the postseason but they weren't even in the post and, and i actually when i was you know preparing for this podcast i had remembered this story differently first of all i thought he was a catcher and he wasn't a catcher and second of all i thought he was playing you know when he came back he was playing in the postseason and so i looked up red Sox and they didn't play in the postseason in 2000 so i was like okay i might <laughs> My memory is <laughs> slightly faulty on this. I think it's because she spoke to a one of the catchers who had caught for Sasaki, and I conflated the two basically mm -hmm. uh, in my mind. But the postseason thing was, you know, was just all my own doing. <laughs> Don't get old. <laughs> I'm already approaching. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess I should probably talk about my second story. Mm -hmm. okay. I had to decide between a couple of stories, but I think I'll choose one where I'm actually playing a sport. <laughs> <laughs> so as I said, I did not do a whole lot of sports growing up, mostly because I was awful at them all. And I just did not generally enjoy them. I found more enjoyment out of other hobbies. But in middle school, I played basketball because my middle school had one sport and it was basketball. So I joined the basketball team like the entire class did. The, the entire <laughs> class would join basketball because there was nothing else to do. And they didn't have cuts, right? Uh, no, they did not have cuts. <laughs> so I was, uh, how to put this? I was the bench. <laughs> People would sit on you? Uh, not quite. <laughs> I'm sure they thought about it, but no, not quite. I was the bench. Me and one of my friends were basically the two worst players on the team, is really the only way to put it. And so we would basically just sit on the sidelines for most of the game, and only when the team was so far ahead, because our team was generally strong, but when the team was so far ahead that they said, oh, we can't lose this one, that's when they would send in Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> so for most of the year, it was me and my friend. And to probably give you an idea of what type of middle schooler I was, my friend and I would sit on the sidelines and talk about the novels we were reading and various <laughs> bits of philosophy. <laughs> Yeah, we actually had been reading philosophy at that point, and we're talking about philosophy on the sidelines of our basketball game. It was a very interesting game, huh? It was so interesting. Philosopher sportsman. <laughs> you should get on LinkedIn and change your... Uh... Yeah, that's that's funny. Change your credentials. But one of the times that they decided to send me in now, I was not exactly athletic. I was not exactly in great control of my body at that time because I was <laughs> in middle school and I was just not generally athletic. So I remember one specific story where I'm running down the court and the one thing that I was pretty decent at was defense. So I got on defense. I was blocking. I was doing that pretty well. Then our team got the ball. I start running down. And as I'm running down somewhere, one of our teammates dropped the ball and the other team got it and everybody turned around and started running back. 
Well, I was a little bit slower on turning around, and apparently I had let my arms basically swing out to help me with the pivot. And in my pivot, I apparently clotheslined one of the other players. <laughs> and this was the moment that I immediately got fouled and pulled off of the court. <laughs> Are you still technically in that foul? I'm pretty sure they have not forgiven me yet. <laughs> One of these days, they'll let me go back in, coach. <laughs> yeah. But no, I apparently laid that kid out with a clothesline. And, you know, from that point on, the team only ever thought of me as two things. A, that I would end up getting a total of two points for the entire year <laughs> in basketball. And B, that when they sent me in, I would probably inevitably injure the other team in some way, shape, or form. <laughs> I don't know. Some teams might like that. Yeah. You know, some teams <laughs> might really like that and make me... Yeah, starter. Yeah. And make me the enforcer or something. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, strangely enough, I hear that basketball is not hockey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. What can you do? Darn the luck. <laughs> yeah, so that gives you an idea of my athletic ability. Yeah. I scored two points, and when I try, I accidentally clothesline people. Well, if it's any consolation, I did gymnastics for six years and was terrible the whole time. <laughs> so. It is yeah. what it is. Yeah. I have one sports skill, and that is running. And I am only moderate at it. But my story starts there. And actually, I coach cross country here. I'm definitely not as good of a coach as Ted Lasso is. <laughs> Maybe someday I'll get there. Yeah. I I wish I could see into player. Well, I wish the problems were as simple and solvable as Ted Lasso's problems. <laughs> well, his problems aren't necessarily solvable, but anyway, <laughs> it all wraps up nicely into a button, right? Into a show. Yeah, exactly. Can be solved in a 30 minute period. Right. I wish real life problems were yeah. like that. <laughs> but I wish I was also more observant to see the problems <laughs> when they're existing. So anyway, this is a story I tell my runners I thought I told it every year, but although one runner said to me the other day, it's like, that's the first time I've heard that. And I was like, you've been a runner for like five years. How can you not have heard that story before? But anyway. Uh, don't put it past our students. <laughs> <laughs> I have definitely told them things that they tell me a week later that I never told them. <laughs> well, and actually, I guess I didn't tell the story this year because this year's cross country was much different than most years of cross country. So yeah, I guess technically I don't tell it every year. But anyway, I do tell it fairly often. And this was the best race of my life. And so this is where I showed that I was moderately good, at least. Not great, but moderately good. And in high school, my junior year, uh, it was the, the postseason, and we had already done our league meet, and we were running in counties. So this is all of the Passaic County of northern Jersey had their meet at this location, and all the schools had gotten together. And we were not a strong school, but we had only ever had one person place in the top 10 in counties from our school in the years that we had been doing cross country. And I think it was back in the 80s or 90s, I think, is when that runner had done it. So back when I, so when I was in high school in the late 90s, it hadn't been done in a while. And I didn't recognize the name of the person who did it. I don't think my coach at the time had coached this guy, so I think it was before that. But anyway, so we were coming to the county meet. And it's a fairly hilly course, and I am not a sprinter of a runner. I'm a cross-country runner who can run uh, the same pace for a long time and, and, and hold the pace. So coming to the end of the course, I knew that I would need to pick it up earlier than most runners because I can't do the finishing sprint as fast as most people. So I better start earlier because my pace will only be moderate compared to their sprints. And, and this course, interestingly, finishes on an uphill for quite a while. It, there's like a 400 meter moderate hill. It's not very tough, but you're kind of going around the hill on your way up it. So it's not it's not direct up. So I was like, well, before that I need to do it. And just before that, there is a more steep incline for about 50 meters. It's not long, but I decided at the bottom of that 50 meter hill, that's where I'm gonna start moving. And I picked it up there and there were three people in front of me and I didn't know where I was in the race, but I figured these three guys I'm gonna catch on this 50 meter hill. So I caught them and passed them on the hill and then pushed as hard as I could up the last 400 meters and two of them passed me 
just before the finish line <laughs> because yeah well i mean kind of expecting it but still two of them passed me just before yeah. the finish line and i crossed and i was like okay well i gave it my all I, I passed at least one of them but i couldn't couldn't catch the other two and i find out later that i had placed 10th which is the last place that you can get for, to be all county <laughs> so i squeaked in there at the very last <laughs> little bit good. <laughs> later the, the next school year I introduced myself to some other guy on another team and he goes, oh, you're Nate Rudd. Yeah, I placed 11th at counties. <laughs> I met the guy that I... <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, I passed you. <laughs> he was nice and upset at me. But but I tell my cross-country runners all the time every year that no matter where you are in the race, you got to push to do your best, whatever your best is. So I say, you know, I passed those three guys and two of them passed me in the end. But I knew that I had given my all to get to where I was to finish right so you know and i had no idea that i got all county but because i'd had decided to pass those three guys i ended up making all county and you made that other guy mad exactly <laughs> that, that was well worth it it was funny to learn to meet him later on i was like whoops yep. <laughs> one of the things i strive for often in cross country is do your best whatever your best is and even if your best isn't going to be your best time because it's rainy or muddy or whatever and all the conditions are against you or the course is extra hilly do your best, whatever your best is. Uh, leave it all out there. Uh, come across the line dying because that's all I can ask and that's all I want to see you do, um, even if we don't yeah. win or lose. The only thing you want to see them do is come across the line dying? Exactly. That's all I want to see. <laughs> I want to see you coming across the line, falling over. <laughs> if you're not dying, crossing this line, go back and start again. <laughs> <laughs> so most of them do a pretty good job of that. Some of my runners don't. Yeah. But most of them are great runners, so I'm very pleased with my team in general. That's good. I, uh, yeah, I did gymnastics for six years. My, both of my brothers, I have two older brothers and they both did gymnastics and they were both state champions. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I did gymnastics for six years and was never nearly, <laughs> nearly as good as they were. I think, I think when I finally got my senior year, I think I was seventh in the whole state on pommel horse. Oh, if I recall correctly, I'm not, don't hold me to that. But it was not like, yeah, I didn't get a medal and it wasn't anywhere up there. I didn't win anything. <laughs> it was, <laughs> I mean, our team was really good. We, I think we, we did win the state championship, but I was not, I was always like, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't say the weak link on the team, but just like my score usually, usually didn't count towards the team score. Like, cause they usually, they only use like the top scores and then you get like four five people to compete and i think they use the top three scores and occasionally my score would count but most of the time it did not so but i tried mm -hmm. i think that was my attitude too right it was like i was out there to do something to have fun and to do as well as i could do and i had dreams of being as good as my brothers but i never was and that was fine but that's not my story <laughs> i always love encouraging the kids that have you know the kids that are in the back that have a two-minute personal record in the middle of the season right like those are the kids that tried hard, right? I mean, even though, I mean, I, in some ways, actually, I feel bad for the front runners because they've been, they've been training so long over the summer that really they can only improve like 30 seconds over the course of the season. I mean, it depends on how dedicated they are. Maybe they can improve more. But, but sometimes those people in the back that are just discovering how to run and how to push hard, they can have the biggest improvements and shine the most in terms of that metric. Well, the front runners have their own glory, so I guess I shouldn't worry about them so much. <laughs> but the people in the back that have the two-minute PRs, they're the ones that I get excited about, and I, I love encouraging. So anyway. Yeah, no, my, my story is about somebody else doing sports. <laughs> <laughs> it's about other people doing sports. Sounds good. So 17 years ago, something like that, I w used to work for a company where I did like mostly corporate IT stuff. And one of the, the women that I worked with, her husband was the groundskeeper for Safeco, well, what was then Safeco Field. I frankly can't even remember what it is now. T-Mobile something, I think it's T-Mobile now. But anyway, so she used to do this um, charity thing every year where she would get people in the company to like, you know, contribute. And who I think whoever gave the most could be a groundskeeper for the day. And I think I tied like this, this friend of mine who worked there, we were both trying to try, you know, trying to get it because it didn't, you know, it wasn't like <laughs> it wasn't like they had one position open or something like that. It's a charity thing. Like they could they could have taken five people if they wanted to. So we, we go up there and there was really surprisingly little preparation. <laughs> I think they did teach us how to like rake. They taught us how to rake the infield, but they didn't tell us like the finer points of the thing. <laughs> You know, they put us in like the little the uniform. They had some extra uniforms laying around. So they, we got in the uniforms and then the game started. And so the Mariners were playing 
the angels. So it, it, there were certain times when we'd have to run out and like get the field back in shape, basically. And then the thing that we did was rake the infield. And so you had this giant rake thing. And I didn't really quite pay attention enough, I guess, to how, you know, how the people who, whose job this was did things. <laughs> and so when it came time for us to run, you run out of the dugout, which is where the, you know, the, the visit, you run out from the visitor's dugout. And there was kind of a backup of all these groundskeepers who were running in single file up the right side of the stairs. And that should have been a tip off to me. But I thought, well, we can do this faster if I go up the left side. But of course, the players are running down the left side. <laughs> and so I'm standing there with this big rake and I jump to the side and start running up. And David Eckstein, the shortstop for the Angels, comes running down the other side. And I did not hit him. <laughs> But there was a second there when it was very close and he was very surprised to see me. He did not say anything. He did not yell at me or anything. And I, but I quickly jumped back to the other side, but I almost took out David X time with a rake. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's pretty fun. In a way, I wish I had, it would have been a better story. <laughs> <laughs> and then the Mariners won the game. <laughs> and then the, and the Mariners did lose that game. <laughs> So maybe the Mariners wish I had taken out David next time. Right. <laughs> At least their fans do. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, I don't think they had a good season that year. I was a big Mariners fan for a long time and, and was super in, like had, you know, was in a season ticket pass and everything, you know, a group of people bought season tickets and watched them all the time and played fantasy baseball and all this stuff because they were really good around that time, you know, particularly like 2001 mm -hmm. and 2002. And then they started just not getting good. And it was just, it was so disillusioning and they haven't been good particularly since. And it's just like, I was like, I think I'm done with baseball. I will. I love <laughs> watching baseball. I love seeing them play. I love, but I was done being like a hardcore fan because it was just seemed like I was putting all this effort into it and was not getting anything back. <laughs> That was when Suzuki, uh, Ichiro Suzuki was playing, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so he was super fun to come, you know, when he came, just going to see him play was an absolute delight because mm -hmm. his style of play was so different than what most people were, you know, I mean, we, in the United States for years stressed hitting home runs so much that seeing a player like him was completely refreshing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was in Japan in 2001 for college. So it was a big deal that he had moved to America yeah. then. Yeah. So Sasaki was the first one and then he came and it was just, it was mm -hmm. both of them were so good. Mm -hmm. Sasaki was so dominating. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. And particularly for the Mariners who had a terrible bullpen. I mean, just absolutely awful bullpen. And then he would come in and just like shut it down every game. Yeah, I read, I read a ter like a awful sort of, uh, not an interview, but like just like about a, I think they did talk to him a little bit, but just the story about Ichiro just, because they talked about his relationship with his father and how strained that's been for so long because his father was so hard on him and trying to make him be like the perfect baseball player. And then also just the fact that he's at the end of his career and he doesn't seem like he knows exactly what to do now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like he loved playing the game so much and that was what he did and that was what he knew that he's just at this weird crossroads in his life and wasn't exactly sure where he was going next. It was really kind of sad, unfortunately. Maybe he could become the Ted Lasso of baseball. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> he seems like the kind of guy who might be able to. <laughs> it's either that or he becomes the Roy. <laughs> <laughs> so I challenged Ryan to watch Ted Lasso season one because I thought it was excellent when I watched it last year. Even reviewing it for this episode was reminded how wonderful it was. I thought we could have somebody like John, who is a big fan as well, support me in pushing this wonderfulness onto Ryan. <laughs> Absolutely. I've been drooling over the AFC Richmond shirt that John has for sale, so I, I think <laughs> I, I need to be buying that the next time I make an order from Cotton Bureau, that's for sure. Send me money. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I highly support this. <laughs> I'm glad that you had me watch this one. So so you did. you have watched the whole season? I watched the whole season since the last time we recorded. Okay. So what Nate does is he challenges me to watch something, read a book, do something like that, mm -hmm. and I will watch or read whatever he has assigned me, uh, and that's generally the <laughs> pattern we go in. You guys do work in a school, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we have podcast homework. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. just show up and we start talking. Actually, that's not true. On Biff, we have to watch something, but... <laughs> 
Yeah, so for example, we recorded last week and so between last week and this week, I ended up watching all 10 episodes. Only five hours of television. Yeah, but it's easy to burn through. I mean, it is so easy to burn through. Once you start the episodes, it's so hard to go, okay, I'm only going to watch one episode. No, mm -hmm. I'm also a binger. So I tend to, when I watch a TV series, I tend to watch it all in one go. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's how I watched The Mandalorian. That's how I watched pretty much generally every TV show I ever watch. I mean, whenever I go back and rewatch Firefly, I will usually watch at least two or three episodes at night. Yeah. In these days, that's the best way to watch, right? Since everything is on a streaming service, mm -hmm. practically, on a particular streaming service, you can then say, I'm going to spend money on these particular services this month and I'm going to binge these particular shows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because otherwise you got to pay for everything. All the time. Which <laughs> I'm constantly struggling with. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather not admit that I still do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like I, I do that with too many services, but Disney got me with like a year-long subscription thing. And then Apple got me with their bundle. And of course, you know, Amazon comes with all this other, the Amazon stuff. So, but the thing that I'm now struggling with is Netflix. Mm -hmm. Since Netflix has like gone up to like 17 bucks or something like that, it's like, boy, do I really, am I getting that much utility out of it? It's gone up? For the 4K plans, right? Yeah. Yeah, I have the Japanese plan, so I don't think it's gone up here yet. Not yet. It's cheaper here still, but. Yeah, it's gone up here though. Yeah. Well, you can pay in yen. Sorry, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, you can you can pay, you can pay in yen and just eat the international costs. <laughs> just use a VPN. Exactly. So yeah, I watched Ted Lasso early, I think compared to most people, and I was really not thinking anything about it particularly. I was thinking that I was not going to like it actually, because I knew that it was based on a bunch of commercials that were done for NBC when NBC started uh, showing British football. And it was done as a promotion for their playing of uh, Premier League football. And I was not that interested in soccer. And I had watched a couple of the commercials and thought that they were mildly funny, but thought, oh, man, a whole show based on that. I don't know how that's going to go. And it's really not either of those things. <laughs> I mean, some of the jokes are actually pulled from the commercials, but his attitude is so much deeper, his whole ethos is so much deeper obviously than what's in the commercials that it's a, just an entirely different show part of me was very hesitant when nate originally suggested this one because i am um i'm aware of uh sport <laughs> <laughs> you've heard of it i have heard of sport mm -hmm. i have occasionally gone and seen a baseball match <laughs> I, I'm kidding. I do enjoy watching baseball, but I am not what one would consider um, sporty at all. But watching baseball is about the only sport that I will even watch. The rest of them, I'm eh, I'm aware of them. Yeah. I encourage other people who love them. For example, my brother is a huge Premier League fan. Or at least he was a couple of years back. Since I moved to Japan, I haven't kept up on how much he loves watching this sport, but I assume mm -hmm. it's still a lot. I am aware of this sport, so watching an entire TV show about Premier League just did not seem like, oh, yeah, 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 this this is something that I would want to do. Right. Yeah, right. So the two things you know about it, just seeing commercials, are that it's soccer and it's a comedy. Mm -hmm. And what makes it so great is neither of those two things. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. It's the fact that it's about people and being nice to people and trying to encourage other people to also be nice to people <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. finding ways to yep being the best person you can be so i was going back through my twitter feed and i think the august 16th is the first time that i mentioned ted lasso and it just says ted lasso is great and, and so i <laughs> i was watching it and i was kind of like i was blown away and i also didn't want to like overplay it to people because i assume you were only part way through yeah, I mean, like, all the episodes hadn't been out yet. I think I this was probably after I watched the first three, which were, I think they were released the first three together and then released the next ones uh, one at a time. And recently I heard about, I mean, mostly I, after other people started watching it, they seemed to really, everybody really seemed to enjoy it. And, and 
but recently someone just watched it. Oh, I can't remember if someone I follow on Twitter and said that they liked it, but they didn't like it as much as everybody said <laughs> that they were going to like it. And I think I have, that's happened to me a lot where people have said, Oh my God, this is amazing. And then I watch it and I'm kind of like, it's, it's <laughs> it was good, right. but it wasn't amazing. And yeah. I don't know if that, I mean, I, I feel like some of that just could be like setting up people's expectations too high. So I don't want to, it's overhyped to the point where you're expecting something that is life, like life alteringly yeah. good. Mm -hmm. And you go, well, it was good, but it wasn't, I, I don't feel an existential crisis about how awesome it was. Yeah. Yeah. I should probably say for those of you who don't know, Ted Lasso is a show on Apple TV that centers around the titular character and their experiences as an American football coach who has taken a job as a football coach for Richmond Premier League, despite never having coached or even knowing the rules of <laughs> soccer. <laughs> that last part's the best part. <laughs> no, yes. <laughs> 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 and his focus on basically this this belief of uniting this group of players together as a team and being genuinely positive and a good human being and encouraging other people to do the same. Yeah, that's kind of how I would sum it up at the very yeah. least. Yeah. And he walks into a dysfunctional family and yeah, and tries to fix it, basically. Exactly. Just by being a good guy. <laughs> and I will say that after watching the entire series in effectively actually three days. So <laughs> that shows you exactly how much free time I have. <laughs> it was fantastic. I really loved it. Oh, good, good, good. I felt it was so uplifting, so positive, even when awful things were happening around him. Just that attitude of positivity and that bringing together that dysfunctional family Mm -hmm. was just so ah, it was just it was an awesome look at a character and his experiences i just thought it was excellent yeah and the timing couldn't have been better either yes mm. we're in the middle of a global pandemic and people are locked inside their houses and here comes this message of hopefulness and kindness mm -hmm. for everybody so i think that probably has something to do with it i think it's a good show regardless but it's timely. Yeah, it is in the middle of a time where we're all kind of going, I hate to put it this way, but many of us might be losing faith in humanity. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of that reminder that no, people are generally good or some people are generally good. <laughs> so, or, or they, yeah, I mean, or they basically most people just need to be helped a little bit to be good <laughs> right mm -hmm. loved to be reminded it can be a relatively small thing to turn a jerk into a nice person yeah mm. in some situations i'm sure there's <laughs> and there are some people you know there are some people at the end of the show who are still jerks but <laughs> but also at the end of the show you notice that some of those jerks there are a lot of inroads being made into mm -hmm. into jamie's life for instance yeah jamie yeah. of course yeah right mm-hmm I just think of all of the characters who were changed and altered by Ted Lasso being genuine. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key for me is the fact that if he was just hokey and nice, that'd be one thing. But it's the fact that he genuinely is nice. And I think the third episode where he is interviewed by Trent Cram yes. is kind of the, the point where it comes together the best because Trent is trying to do what you're trying to do which is trying to figure this guy out and like is he is he joking or is he i mean what is what is this guy's or is he an idiot mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what is this guy's deal and it turns out he's not joking and he's not an idiot <laughs> <laughs> you know he's like mr rogers kind of but he's you know funnier and a little more irreverent <laughs> <laughs> because of how genuine he was and because of how much he emphasized believing in that family that was just what brought me in and went yeah no this is a great show this is a great message and he was just nice to everybody regardless of how they treated him mm -hmm. i keep thinking of the guys at the pub and <laughs> really the one guy who was always very nice to him <laughs> the, other two, yeah. the other two don't understand why he keeps trying to humanize him <laughs> 
I also like that the one guy who was nice to him was also the one who ended up with a dart in his arm when his <laughs> son visited. <laughs> nope, it's all right. Mm-hmm. This happens. Yeah, probably does. Yeah, actually, I was just realizing he does pretty much affect everyone on the show, maybe except Higgins. But he positively changes almost everybody. Well, I think, yeah, I mean, I think he makes, you know, Higgins feels guilty through the whole thing because he's... Yeah, abetted. Yeah. Although I think he starts out feeling guilty even before he knows Ted very well. Mm-hmm. But he stands up to Rebecca. Yeah. yeah, Higgins has his own arc, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Rupert doesn't have a redemption, at least in this season. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah so it's been renewed for two more. I think they've decided they're going to do two more seasons and that'll be it because they have that much story. You know, I think that's appropriate, and I'm glad that they have an idea of what they're doing and are not just going to say, we're Ted Lasso forever. We'll just keep patting it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Korean TV shows do My wife is Korean, actually, and Korean TV shows do that. They'll like, here's our story, and then we're going to finish. We're going to wrap. Yeah. yeah. To yeah. me, it seems like, good, there's not going to be fluff. We're not going right. to be stringing people around. Yeah. I mean, I think you can do that Like, if it's a comedy show that, just a sort of situation comedy and was like well, we're gonna just make jokes forever i mean maybe you could get away with that i mean the simpsons manages to be i mean my <laughs> son still likes watching them so you know i think the fact that they are also going here's the story we're gonna tell that's it i do like that yeah so in addition to all of this the fact that it is this kind of show that is uplifting and yet funny and yet all these different things. Is this the reason why you really wanted me to watch this show, I guess, is the question I would have? Yeah, I think so. Because I was watching this in the fall, like John said. I wasn't quite as early as John in watching it. I think I had waited till I heard two or three people on the podcast say that it was exciting before I started watching it. But it was a show that I was able to watch with my wife, which we don't watch too many shows together. So this was a nice one to watch together. Yeah, I watched the first few episodes by myself and then got her into it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we were watching this during the pandemic. You said August was the first? Yeah, so- August. I think it came out sometime early. I can't remember exactly when, but I my first tweet about it was August 15th, and I feel like I watched the first three episodes by then. So I would say maybe the 8th or something it came out. Oh, okay, okay. So I guess it was this this quarter. Huh. I thought it was more in the pandemic, but but still, it was a nice thing that we were able to eat yeah, with – with, I guess maybe it was because of the stress at the beginning there, but it was a way that we were able to decompress um, mm-hmm. watching Ted Lasso, and that was a real nice benefit. So I enjoyed it for that. Yeah. I am intrigued to see what kind of character arcs they are going to bring in the next two seasons. Right. Mm-hmm. I do wonder where they go from here, but mm-hmm. you can imagine with the football part of it where they're going to go from here. Yeah. But... I don't know what the character is exactly where they're going to go. I mean, I guess there's a there's definitely a thing with Jamie going on. I mean, I would imagine that somehow Jamie comes back to the team and or something. And I guess the other way they could take it is what happens with Roy. Yeah, thank you, Roy. Yeah, Roy. Yeah, right. There's a little bit of question about what's going to happen with him. Yeah, I liked his character arc. It's rough, but it was good. Yeah, and I just like him. I mean, I yeah <laughs> yeah. He's a great actor. <laughs> I identify with that anger level a little bit. So. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite part with him is, is when he gives him a, a wrinkle in time. <laughs> mm-hmm. it's, it's, Am I supposed to be the little girl? <laughs> I'd like you to be. <laughs> and then as he's finishing reading it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so great. <laughs> I mean, I think I think it'll work out for Roy. I think it'll work out for Roy. <laughs> yeah. I am very intrigued to see what they do with him as a yeah. player and as a character. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I suppose it's possible he becomes a coach with them or he becomes a coach for a different team. Ooh, a competing team. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. That'd be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. All of these are possibilities. Or maybe he goes on a killing spree. I don't know. <laughs> Take it in a completely different direction. <laughs> <laughs> it becomes another Bane in a different line, huh? <laughs> He's angry. I mean, he's clearly angry about things. Huh. He's going to become the PR manager. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that's what Keeley's doing, right? Never mind. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I don't know. Job's taken. <laughs> the new kit man. <laughs> <laughs> that would be pretty funny, actually. <laughs> It'd be funny, but can you imagine how disheartening that would be? Yeah. I mean, I think he would basically tell everybody to pick up their own stuff. Yeah. Yeah. 
I don't see Roy picking up other people's shirts. <laughs> no. His pride was already swallowed to go to second team to go that much. That's a much bigger jump. Yeah, really. Yeah. That was all he could stand. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Reached his limit. And I also really like the evolution of how the team treats Nate. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Because at the beginning, Nate is effectively everybody's whipping boy. Literally. They're, they're like whipping him with towels. Yeah. <laughs> and he accepts that. But by the end, he has gained a whole lot more confidence and everyone generally looks out for and cares for him. Yeah. Uh, so I liked that. Mm-hmm. I think there are a lot of places they can go with it. I am very curious on what directions they choose to take. Which things are going to throw into the cogs, right? What? How will they trip him up? Yeah. I mean, apparently Rebecca is not going to quite be the foil that she was this season. Right. So what are going to be the stumbling blocks in future seasons? And actually, Rupert's probably not a bad idea. Yeah. Maybe it will be more of Rupert. But anyway, interesting to ponder. Yeah, I would think it's got to be him, at least a little bit. Mm-hmm. It's got to be him. I mean, he's going to have a kid. <laughs> <laughs> yep. 70-something-year-old man. Yeah. Can you imagine that at 70? I waited until my 40s, and that was <laughs> that was really hard. <laughs> Seriously, I can't imagine that at 70? Yeah, that character is not going to be spending a lot of time parenting, but for an actual caring parent, yeah, it would be kind of uh, backbreaking. Yeah. I am curious if he's going to have any growth. Because as he is written right now, he just seems like an absolute scumbag. That That's the word I will use. Yeah. Yeah, he's the one character in the show who's sort of cardboard cutout evil villain, which I think it's fine for this season, certainly. Yeah, for this season, I feel like that's fine because that's the total amount of image that Ted Lasso has of him mm-hmm. at this point because that's how much he knows of him. So it yeah. might be that it's further developed in the future. Yeah, right. Might be. Yeah, it might be, because I wonder how they can bring him in and still maintain Rebecca <laughs> in a non-crazy state. But yeah, that's the challenge, I guess. They also mentioned something. I mean, I don't, I don't follow British football, but they said something about the team getting broken up. Oh. Oh, yeah, they mentioned that too. Possibly. Yeah. Well, what happens is, if I recall correctly, when you go into relegation, you're dropped from the Premier League to the Championship League. Right. And many times, if that happens... Since a lot of the players are Premier League level, many of them will try to leave that team Uh, to get back, recruited back into the Premier League. Okay, yeah, makes Uh, sense. The owner would have some say over that, right? The owner and the players would have say over that. Yeah. Whether Mm -hmm. or not they wanted to leave and whether or not, and what kind of contracts they had and things like that. And it seems like most of these players like Ted and would probably not necessarily want to leave. Yeah, at least some key ones. Yeah. I would think that the amount of money that they're making wouldn't change because they have a contract. Yeah. Which must be tricky for <laughs> for them, I imagine. Yeah, if they're not in the Premier League, they're not making as much money in the stands. Yeah. So that's the question because I assume that you have a contract for X number of years getting this much money. So are they going to eat the cost? How are they going to get that money? But again, the city seems to have that much love for that team then yeah. maybe it won't be affected as much. Right. But especially if it seems like they're going to fight their way back into the Premier League. Yeah, they got it. I mean, they, you know. <laughs> they, they got it. Otherwise, <laughs> yeah, the arc doesn't make sense. That's the end of season three. I, mean, it's good. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I actually didn't really think that they were going to get relegated, but I, I certainly thought it was possible. But, but I think if I had to bet, I would have bet that they were not going to get relegated. But That it was going to have an uplifting ending. Yeah. To like, hey, yeah, we did it. Yeah. I actually like it better because it didn't. I think I do too. Mm-hmm. I do too now also, but I would have been with what John was saying too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I would have agreed with you for sure. I think it's the fact that normally so many times we're told with stories, with TV, with fairy tales that, hey, the good guy has good things that happen to him. Yeah. But life isn't always that way. And so seeing this in a TV show where the good guy doesn't get everything. And yet is still a good guy. I mean, even throughout the season, besides the regular plot, he has his wife leaving him and a bunch of other things and he still bounces back. Yeah. And so I think seeing the strength of character in him, despite everything that happens, is really nice. Yeah. Also, I'm very curious on what the recipe for the biscuits were. (laughs) 
<laughs> there was no recipe. For the, there was no real recipe for the biscuits. Was, there was a piece that interviewed her and she would talk about they just tasted like dry sponges. They were awful. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and she just had to pretend that they were completely delicious. Well, it's that. And I don't remember at what point he says it, but he walks in and goes, and I hope these taste awful. But who am I kidding? I've unlocked the recipe. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best batch yet. <sighs> You know, for a show that's ostensibly about soccer, there's not that much soccer in it. <laughs> right. Very little. With, yeah. And the parts that are, are the good parts of soccer. Mm -hmm. Right. Where you actually wanted to pay attention. Yeah. There's yeah. some training. I mean, there's probably more training than actual like gameplay, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. still most of it happens in the locker room, I think. Which, I mean, it makes sense for a show focused on the coach. Yeah. Or the characters. Mm hmm yeah right exactly yeah and the other plus about this show is like just since i now have this big beard i was able to go as coach beard for halloween so. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool that's a good disguise an older coach beard i guess but still coach beard nonetheless nobody knew who i was we didn't really go anywhere either <laughs> so that was the i mean like i was mostly just around the house but my wife and i she had been planning well we have a dog well we have two dogs but one of our dogs is a standard poodle who was white and she has been meaning to go as bo peep for years you know dragging around the white poodle and um so she finally decided to do it this year because he's getting old and he's had some health trouble this year and so she was thinking eh, he might not be around next year so i should probably do it this year if i'm going to do it so she spent a whole bunch of time making this bo peep costume and i was like well, where are we going to wear this i mean we're not even going to be going anywhere and so we just decided we were going to wear our costumes while we were out walking the dogs <laughs> and yeah so i was able to slap together a reasonable coach beard outfit, but nobody knew. I mean, the, we did see some bunch of neighbors and of course everybody complimented on her outfit and people asked me who the heck I was supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. Which is what usually happens. Is like, she's a, she's a private investigator. So every time we go to a party, <laughs> Everybody wants to talk to her and nobody wants to talk to me. <laughs> what do you do? Oh, I write online. Oh, okay. You wrote about computers again, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What do well, you write about technology? Okay. Anyway. <laughs> about that murder that you're working on. <laughs> and her stories are simply more interesting. I'm not. Uh... <laughs> There's no question about it. People are right. <laughs> I don't know. The AirPods are a pretty fun story, John. Yeah. They're so, oh, yeah. It's super exciting. <laughs> Let me tell you about my Minecraft book. <laughs> there are great roles for women in this show. Mm -hmm. I think the arcs of Keely and Rebecca are wonderful. I mean, that's the thing that, they, like, you know, he finds Keely, and Keely is kind of a kindred spirit to him, right? I mean, she's very positive and she wants to be nice to people. And they hit it off immediately. Um, yeah, she sees the good in Jamie still. Yeah. And she befriends Rebecca and helps make that whole arc possible because she, you know, there's a whole thing about accountability and she ends up holding Rebecca accountable mm -hmm. when Rebecca basically tells her that she needs to hold Jamie accountable. That's what friends should do. <laughs> <laughs> and it works out wonderfully in the show. I really did like their relationship because of the fact that originally it was clear that she was genuinely afraid of Rebecca. Yeah. <laughs> and how that relationship just goes, okay, I've decided to not be afraid of I you anymore. I decided I'm not going to be afraid of you anymore. For some reason that reminds me of Nate and the fact that he is so scared in the very beginning to even go into her office and talk to her. And then at the end, he's yelling at her because he thinks he's been fired. <laughs> <laughs> right, <yeah. laughs> calling her name you know my name <laughs> yeah and she knows her name also i loved coach beard yeah yeah i thought he was yeah. a, just a fantastic character yeah yeah in sort of simple in a lot of ways simple to the extent that his name is his appearance mm -hmm. I mean, he doesn't have a huge number of lines particularly he's mostly standing around <laughs> looking <laughs> he stands around nods says like three words yeah, right, right, right. Very few words. It's the fact that all those words are like very specifically chosen kind of thing. I, I just thought he was an excellent character. <laughs> but but he also has other stuff going on. I mean, I love when they hint at chess club, right? Like, oh, mm -hmm. he's integrated a little bit into England also in his own way. 
Um, so that's kind of fun. And he chimes in in the background a fair number of times that are very, very funny. Like, oh, yes. Something about the Gershwins. And... <laughs> yeah, they have a bunch of good jokes. <laughs> just, like, just like little lines thrown, like off screen. He's yeah. calling out off screen. I think I like him because he is such a contrast to Ted. It makes him so much funnier. Yeah. And everything that he says just land great. Mm -hmm. And him being a great character in general because of that difference. Yeah. That's how they work together so well, too, I think. I mean, you can see how that makes sense because he's the assistant coach and he's he's supplementing Ted in the ways that he's deficient and mm. making sure that things can run smoothly. Like, he's the one who spends all the time figuring out how soccer works <laughs> 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 on, the, on the plane ride over. <laughs> Seems like he might have wanted to do it before that, but... <laughs> but also that whole first scene where the press are all asking him random trivia about soccer. Mm -hmm. And that just showing how little that they actually knew about soccer was great. Yeah, yeah. Did you touch? Who's that guy uh, he, who, who bends it like himself? <laughs> <laughs> and the people in the bar yelling at the screen. <laughs> I would imagine that almost anybody can like this show. I mean, there's a few things, you know, that maybe aren't for little kids or something like that. We, um, my son didn't really want to get into it, so he has not seen it. Mm -hmm. If he doesn't want to watch it, that's fine. But I think, you know, he's certainly, you know, he's 17 now. He's certainly old enough to see it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's some sexual jokes and stuff like that in there. There's sexual jokes. If a parent really cares about crass language, right? there is a significant amount of that. Especially if you're in England, but I don't know some of the words. <laughs> I spend enough time with people who speak British English that uh, I definitely know all those words. <laughs> and the, and there, are, there are jokes about, you know, like making up little phrases that um, are absurd uses of British English is pretty good, too. <laughs> Get the boot for putting the boot in the boot. <laughs> How many countries in this country? <laughs> Four. <laughs> That's about right. But thanks so much for coming on, John. Yeah, thank you. It was great. Great to have you. Yeah. No, thanks for having me. Yeah. Tell Japan I miss it. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. Will do. <laughs> I'm sure it's been dying to know where I am. <laughs> we'll make sure we give it a forwarding address. Okay. Please do. Please do. I wouldn't. Yeah. I haven't heard from it in a while. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful that you were able to come on with such short notice because... Yes. Sorry. Oh, no, that's fine. Yeah, no, I mean, you said you were talking about Ted Lasso. That's all I needed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think, Nate, you decided that we were going to officially talk about Ted Lasso last week. And then the next day, you said, we could try to get John Maltz on here. <laughs> he's a big fan he's a big fan yeah, he's got nothing else to do uh, well, well i wasn't sure of that actually we, we were actually well, that would have been correct we were actually thinking he's probably so busy he, he's, yeah. he's probably gonna say no <laughs> nope no problem so i'm extremely grateful for you being able to make time to come and talk to us yep yep because i've, no, I've personally good, really enjoyed good time. it yep yep so did i i had fun Thank you. Thanks a lot, John. Thanks for having me. All right, Ryan, what do we have next week? As I said before in our yearly recap episode, I really loved the movie Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. And so I thought it'd be good to have you watch it and get a chance to talk about it with you. Sounds good to me. I'm interested in this movie. Growing up watching Mr. Rogers sounds like it will be interesting for sure. Oh yeah, it's definitely a really, it's a really touching movie is how I would say. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm looking forward to getting you to watch mm -hmm. it. Thank you. We hope you did enjoy the episode, especially with our special guest this week, but the conversation doesn't have to end here. The discussion can continue with us through Reddit at r slash on or contacting us through Twitter at MyHillToDion. You can also reach us by email, which, to no one's surprise, is myhilltodion at gmail.com. And finally, we upload all of our episodes to our YouTube channel, which is also named, say it with me now, folks, My Hill to Die On. Nate? Yeah, that's it. No, oh, sorry. No. Sorry, I didn't. I, <laughs> I, 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 thought, I thought I was I... taking it all in. <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> Which is not good on a podcast. I need to be talking more. Needed often. a moment. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just needed a moment. I was like, Nate's suddenly very quiet. This is weird. <laughs> <laughs> he's gone a whole five seconds Usually without talking. Usually his society's been disconnected. On? Yeah. And her stories are simply more interesting. I'm not... Uh... <laughs> There's no question about it. People are right. <laughs> I don't know. The AirPods are a pretty fun story, John. Yeah. They're so, oh, yeah. It's super exciting. <laughs> Let me tell you about my Minecraft book. Yeah. Actually, I, I was looking at that again because uh, my daughters were looking at Roblox. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. We're going to go on a side tangent here, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my daughter really wanted to do Roblox, and I signed her up for an account with the parental controls turned on, and she was all upset at me. Because I turned all the printer controls on. Sure. Well, yeah. There's got to be something better than Roblox. Maybe I got to start her on Minecraft. Minecraft's definitely better than Roblox. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Hank spent a bunch of time interested in Roblox, and I always hated it. He liked it for a while, because I think he had a friend who was playing it, and I think it was more like a thing. Like, he could play online with that friend, right, and right. that friend wasn't quite as into Minecraft. But overall, he's definitely played Minecraft way more than he's played Roblox and still occasionally plays Minecraft, whereas he hasn't played Roblox in years. Mm -hmm. And I will say the things that you can do in Minecraft are just so much more than what you can do in Roblox. Yeah. I still remember that when I occasionally used to play Minecraft, I would basically design labyrinths. <laughs> That's all I would ever do is I would just make <laughs> giant dungeon like labyrinths with <laughs> traps and everything <laughs> secret doors and things like that and i had loads of fun with that sort of stuff yeah i never got too into the like that much of like building oh, I, I built a big pyramid one time but i mostly just love like the first few days like mm. you know like building up and getting and I, and I would do that over and over again like just starting over again and finding a place to, you know, to make a little cave and like finding the first things that you can make a bed and all that stuff. I'll, I'll probably, you know, do that for a long. I mean, I still, every once in a while, <laughs> like we'll fire it up and do it. Um, it's fun. I can start with the iOS version, right? I would at least get that yeah. experience through there. Okay. Yeah. That's probably the best, the, the easiest way to start. Sure. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I gotta, I gotta take a look into that. I mean, that was, that was another game. Like I think it's like 26 or something bucks. And, mm. oh my God, I mean, the amount of, and they, you know, you pay for it once and you play forever and the amount of gameplay. I mean, there's obviously lots of other things, ways. I mean, particularly now that it's owned by Microsoft, it's like they, they try and get you for <laughs> all the add-ons and things like that. But overall, I mean, the amount of gameplay they've gotten out of like 26, 27 bucks is, is incredible. I'm going to have to take a look into that. I actually have a, I think it's called Toka Builder because I had all the Toka Boca games when they were little. And they actually still play Toko Builder every once in a while, building things in that space. So I think now that my daughter's in middle school, I think I need to move her on to the, to the next level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Something yeah, that homework for you. Yeah, because I, I got homework. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna write that down. <laughs> <laughs> like so, the only time that I worked in Japan was that summer that I was there. So I was there from like the worst part of the year. Oh like yeah, April through. You're right. April to August <laughs> that would have been nice and hot. Yeah, it was awful. Yeah, which makes me really wonder. I think somebody got paid off to make the Olympics in August. Why would the Olympics <laughs> be in August in Japan? Who decided that? And what's the city again? In Tokyo. Oh, it's in Tokyo. Yeah. Okay. So it's not, yeah, I mean, like the last time was Nagano, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, at least that's a little bit further north, but. And it would be cooler at this probably time. Probably not to make enough to make a difference. Oh, that, that was that was Winter Olympics too. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I don't know. August, I think, is a bad idea, but yeah, why not October? I mean, unless, you're, unless you're doing it in Sapporo or something, but yeah, but they're obviously not. But again, that this is all still assuming that it's going to happen with the world. <laughs> yeah, I do like yeah. that they're still calling it the 2020 Olympics. Yeah, never don't give up that name. <laughs> all the merchandise, well, all the merchandise. Well, exactly. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, they got to sell all the shirts back. <laughs> yeah, I I can't imagine trying to go through each shirt that they've made just cross out the zero and put a one there <laughs> that's see that's particularly hard as someone who's fudged his grades in high school <laughs> i can tell you you don't want to be doing you know you don't want to be trying that you got to turn it into at least an eight right is it <laughs> kids can't do that anymore because <laughs> no. it's all electronic at least uh yeah, currently for sure it is although they could uh bring it up on their parents computer go into the inspector 
change yeah, yeah right <laughs> i suppose so well, i guess you could change the pdf actually yeah i do wonder if it's actually yeah except i get it i get it directly from them yeah from yeah the you know the administrators i don't you know it's not something that goes home in his backpack anymore yeah you can't change the pdf in the email like this is a few years ago but the one they said there was an after school like gaming club a computer gaming club and they sent home this thing that said what level of games that it was okay for your kid to play <laughs> And so we checked, like, you know, a reasonable amount for, I think he was, like, 14 or something like that. And, uh, you know, we checked up to age 14. And I can't remember how it came back, but, like, it came back and it's, like, and it's, you know, it's, like, child, grade schooler or something like that and 14. And we had checked all of those. And then the last one was mature. And we left it blank. And we had checked them all in, like, a blue pen. And then (laughs) it comes home and it's got this big black check mark under mature <laughs> it's very obvious that the same person had not checked that one as well <laughs> you need to work on your technique son <laughs> gotta have copies of all your parents pens and just style the style was completely wrong <laughs> they were not fooled <laughs> good, good. most school staff are at least clever enough to catch that <laughs> I actually i gotta get going because I have a I have a road meeting because I own a one eleventh of the road I live on. Oh no! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh gosh! So I need I need to go to a meeting where I'm not going to understand anything they're saying, and say yes. <laughs> well, well, welcome to the neighborhood association. <laughs> yep, and put my little hunko, my little stamp on the little paper that they're going to yep. put at the end. Probably that's what I'm going to have to yep. do. Gambate <laughs> kudasai. My wife. Hopefully, my wife will understand a little bit what's going on. Um. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you Thanks so much. Thanks very much. Talk to you later. Talk yeah, to you later. Thanks, mm-hmm. Have a good day. Have a good evening. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, yeah. Let's record next time another time because I got to get going though. Yeah. Yeah. We can do that later. It's no, you have to go. And my bladder's near to burst because <laughs> <laughs> I had a full pot of coffee while we were talking here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Ryan. No problem. You, re- you recorded that part, right? <laughs> uh, I have not stopped my recording yet. <laughs> Good. Talk to you later. Talk to you later.